thanks so much, Sarah, for that uh, for that lovely introduction. I'm John. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I'm here as a postdoctoral fellow uh, in Todd Golub's lab, and I've been here for maybe about four or five years developing uh, interests in what we call non-canonical open reading frames. Uh, and we'll talk a lot about those today. This is uh, hopefully going to be uh, informative for you and educational. And I'd encourage any questions and um, you know anything, any thoughts that come along the way. Uh, this is really meant to kind of introduce um, non-experts into the overall topic and, and some of the international developments um, that are going on. And so uh, hopefully this will be fun. Um, what you're looking at is uh, stylized, if a little bit distorted based upon the slide size, a picture of a ribosome translating in RNA, and we can see all sorts of things happening there. And so I think it's a lot of fun. Uh, I have no disclosures uh, today. Uh, and I want to start just by throwing out there uh, a really sort of set of obvious questions that I think always need re-examination, which is, you know, what does a cell translate, right? This is something that uh, is so fundamental. You know, we learn it in, I don't know, middle school or high school or something like that at this point, even elementary school maybe now. And I think, you know, a lot of people would say, oh, well, we translate genes, uh, by which we mean mRNAs uh, to make proteins. And that's a well-described process uh, that happens in the cell uh, uh, cytosol, specifically at ribosomes often co-located near the perinuclear space on the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, and it occurs when ribosome subunits bind to an mRNA uh, and translate uh, a protein product from that RNA. Uh, and so this uh, leads to many different questions, um, questions about you know, how many mRNAs get translated, what's their variation, how many proteoforms or isoforms, glycosylation sites, et cetera, um, what's its regulation. Of course, many of us think about then diseases where this is maybe perturbed or something maybe going wrong or the therapeutic implications of that. That's all, you know, uh, I think very valid. Uh, and this has taken many decades of work to sort of rifle through these different questions. Um, but, you know, there's another way to think about this of where does a cell translate? Well, it translates the coding regions on the mRNAs. Uh, and we think about mRNAs having a coding core region that produces the amino acids and then five prime untranslated regions and three prime untranslated regions. Uh, and there are ways to identify where this uh, 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 pro protein encoding function happens. There are ATG star codons and related to COSAC sequences. But really, I, I, I want to, I don't say this glibly, but I think most of us just think about, well, a cell translates whatever gen code says it translates, right? Um, I, I would suffice to say that before I got into this work, um, like I think many people, I just sort of would download a file of what the proteins are and the transcripts, and it tells you that's where they are. And you say, okay, that's good. So where do they get that list? Because that's actually a lot of power, right? That's actually a fundamentally very powerful position to be able to say, this is what uh, the proteins are and you know, go have at it. So a lot of this comes from the Human Genome Project, right? There's the Broad Institute is steeped in the history of the Human Genome Project, having emerged from the Whitehead the sequencing core uh, run by Eric many years ago uh, and contributing the largest nucleotide fraction, base pair fraction to the overall Human Genome Project uh, in the 90s um, and early 2000s. And so what did they do, right? Um, you know, they basically were sequencing DNA. They weren't sequencing proteins or, or RNAs or anything else at that point. And they were finding new proteins that hadn't been discovered uh, using some very simple metrics, essentially. They were saying, well, um, we know such and such proteins already exist, right? The Human Genome Project is predicated on prior existence of knowledge of famous genes like P53 and others, et cetera. And so they were looking for sites in the genome that were evolutionarily conserved and that encompasses things like DNA domains um, and, and functional domains. Uh, they were looking for things that had specific sequence features. So if they, you were trying to find a new protein, um, you knew that it should be transcribed, you know, number one. So it should have features of an RNA and they had lots of express sequence tag data or, or sort of pre-gene uh, expression, pre-RNA-seq versions of what the transcriptome might be doing. They also knew that sequence features had to uh, I'll have things such as like introns had to make sense uh, if they were present in that gene. Um, often there were things like COSAC sequences already mentioned features that sort of keyed them into where protein might be. But then they also had a heuristic. And that heuristic was, well, if we're going to find new proteins in the human genome, it's got to be greater than or equal to 100 amino acids. We're just going to nominate those. And this is where um, many of the nameless sort of faceless proteins in gen codes data sets come from. These are things like you know, CX ORF14, 
um, and these come up and you know many of them are sort of starting to be functionalized now but why do those have names like CX or 14 and others have names like P53? I mean, that was the size on the blotted gel it had or Sonic Hedgehog, which was some guys who like to play video games in the 1990s named after a video game, right? So where did these names come from? And so the Human Genome Project um, gave them these sort of nameless, faceless names of C chromosome something or something or other. Um, but why did they come up with this 100 amino acid uh, threshold and what does that all mean? So um, this raises the question of really, is there a size basis uh, for protein discovery? Uh, and what you see over, the, over on this side of the, the slide, I actually just screenshotted you know, method sections uh, from some of some papers from a long time ago, um, including major consortium papers on sequencing, stuff that Eric Lander self published, Chris Burge uh, back in the 90s. What they were doing is saying, well, we have to have things that are at least 100 amino acids in length, and they're calling them hypothetical proteins. Uh, and as Chris Burge mentions um, here in this, this actually really nice paper from 97, uh, it really to succinctly say it, the, the length minimum was imposed in order to avoid inclusion of cDNA fragments. Basically, what they're worried about is this is a pre RNA seq, pre whole a human genome project era. Um, and so how do you know that if you're finding these small open reading frames, you're not really just finding a fragment of a larger open reading frame? Because I think people at that time had the working uh, conception, the working assumption that proteins were going to be a sort of sufficient length to fold and sufficient length to have domains and binding domains. Uh, and so what you get in terms of the distribution of protein sizes in our annotated proteome as shown here, this is Swiss prot data from uh, uh, the Uniprot group. Um, and you can see that there's a striking sort of bias against uh, small things because they uh, were uh, biased against here. It's not zero because over time some have been found and even back then some small cytokines and things like that have been found. But really the sort of average area of protein size is in the sort of 300s-ish, 200 to 400-ish range. But, you know, really is there any reason why that might um, be necessary or true or even logical, uh, you could actually make a, an epistemological argument that maybe the curve should look like this, right? And that argument, I'm not necessarily saying it's a correct argument, but the argument might go like this. Um, it takes cellular energy and resources to produce stretches of polypeptides and amino acid sequences. And the first sort of cosmic scum that was growing on Earth and starting to assemble proteins for the first time one might hypothesize that they start by putting together small numbers of amino acids because it's energetically difficult for them to do. And then over time, uh, why wouldn't evolution or organisms have larger numbers of small things? Because it would seem to be energetically uh, more uh, easily done. So I don't know if that's correct or not, but that's sort of one line of thinking when you kind of look at these data. So this size basis. Was there any actual scientific justification to say that they were looking for 100 amino acid new proteins or not? Um, the honest answer is it was a heuristic uh, applied based upon sort of logical best practices. Uh, there wasn't any actual modeling or statistical um, algorithmic approach uh, to nominating this. Uh, in fact, um, the Human Genome Project and then the private Craig Venter competitor, Solera, had different names for their gene finding programs, GenScan or Auto. They both used this. Uh, and a little bit after this all happened, a researcher in Australia named John Maddock um, went back and kind of reanalyzed the human genome uh, and asked the question, um, what, how would this 100 amino acid length um, fit in if you were to try to post hoc rationalize it? Uh, and kind of what they published was that, yes, if you scan the human genome, you can find random open reading frames of, you know, ATG star codons followed by stop codons and something in between. You can find these randomly throughout the human genome. It's just a uh, nucleotide sequence that can occur at some rate. Uh, and so if you were to look at 100 amino acids, it's kind of roughly, but not precisely and not exactly, about two standard deviations above the average open reading length that you could find in a random sequence uh, selected for the genome, and that random sequence was 1KB. So there it is. That's, I think, the only context you can have for this uh, number. I don't know what to make of this because of several things. One, this is not even precise. It's not exactly two standard de deviations. And two, uh, with sort of general 
um, as a generalization with a couple exceptions of genes are not, uh, our proteins are not located as one KB stretches of human genome. Typically there are things like introns, right? And so we do have sets of intronless genes, but they're relatively uncommon. Uh, and so this sort of notion of picking a chunk of 1000 base pairs and modeling that uh, doesn't even necessarily apply to the vast majority of genes with introns. Um, so I'll just say that I don't really think there's necessarily a size basis for discovery and that you can do these types of post hoc analyses, but um, whether or not that's really that informative um, when you think about the human genome uh, may be a, a question. So it's in this context, after John Mag actually did this, not, not shortly after, um, people started to think about genome-wide approaches to defining uh, amino acid translation. And to this, it came out from Jonathan Weissman's group, now at uh, the Whitehead across the street, at this time was at UCSF, actually, uh, Sarah's old alma mater. Um, and Jonathan Weissman uh, has been a brilliant scientist for many years, working initially in protein stability and yeast, um, and was sort of thought very deeply about the protein and had a graduate student actually at that time, Nick Angolia, who is now at Berkeley uh, as an as a associate professor, I believe. Um, and they were inspired actually by Joan Stites' work. Now, Joan Stites uh, is still uh, a scientist, alive and well at Yale. Uh, her husband passed away relatively recently. They were sort of powerhouse. And in 1960, in the 60s, in 1969, a young Joan Stites defined that a ribosome would interact with RNA. Uh, she was actually using initially non-mammalian model systems, but it holds true across uh, species. Um, a ribosome would interact with an RNA of footprint fragments of about 30-ish base pairs, give or take. Uh, and so uh, what Nick Angolia and Jonathan Weissman reasoned was, well, what if we take a cell um, and we break apart the cell and grab the cellular lysate materials? Uh, how would we isolate ribosome bound fractions of RNA? Well, they actually came across a method where you treat heavily with RNAs as well as DNAs to obliterate as best as possible any free floating RNA fragments uh, and DNA fragments in the cell lysate. Uh, and what that then leaves you with is uh, only protected fragments or ribosome protected fragments of RNA that are impenetrable to the RNAs because they are sterically within this uh, 40S and 60S uh, subunit. These can then be filtered out by several different methods, ultracentrifugation or other column-based methods. Uh, and then you can have a small RNA fragment uh, that you then sequence. And this is now called riboseq or ribosome profiling. And so you can see here um, one Nice example of these data. This is now uh, an annotated gene, uh, but this was considered a link RNA for many, many years uh, until we found that there was actually a huge amount of ribosome profiling reads in this one little stretch. And this now makes a, a known protein uh, that I can't quite quote you the exact size, but I think it's around 70-ish amino acids long. Uh, and so using this method, uh, we've now come to having this somewhat uh, imprecise terminology of canonical protein coding genes and non-canonical protein coding genes or non-canonical open reading frames. Um, and essentially non-canonical open reading frames are all of these things that were not located in the human genome project. Uh, and they were not located in the human genome project because they're predominantly small and they're pro predominantly not conserved. And so when you look at sort of the levels of evidence for translation here, um, you can see that canonical protein coding genes are vastly uh, conserved, except for uncommon examples. Uh, generally found by mass spectrometry, this is from the Human Proteome Project data um, as sort of the arbiter of that. Uh, whereas non-canonical translation is uh, rarely conserved, but not never, um, and uncommonly, but not never found by mass spectrometry is really defined by this riboseq. Now, um, this has become a very popular uh, protocol, and you can see here from its sort of early days, uh, to its more recent days. Uh, this is just a screenshot of PubMed and how often it ap appears in PubMed, and it's kind of going straight up. Um, and many people use this for various reasons, not just for finding these little proteins. I can also use informed translational efficiency and regulatory mechanisms, uh, but uh, picking out these little proteins and various non-coding RNAs or other sections of the genome has now become uh, something that many groups are interested in. And you can see here just a fraction of the papers that are kind of out there uh, right now. And, and these are all sort of love, nice to read and, and I recommend it. Um, I don't know if I should pause and see if there are any questions at this point. Uh, I'm happy to sort of um, go along as, as necessary. 
there, one thing I was actually wondering is, uh, and you may get to this, is how tissue specific is this ribosome profiling and how does that intersect with um, like, um, might there be some that don't meet criteria in one tissue, but do in another? And how do you kind of sort through the experimental variation? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. So th this gets the um, a little bit of the notion of bifunctional molecules. And this has become a hot topic because uh, there's a large community of non-coding link RNA researchers. And that's where I actually started my PhD. Um, and that community feels very strongly that link RNAs are real, and I believe that too, and, and link RNAs have um, functions at the RNA level, and I believe that also. Um, but then it comes along and you see something like this in the middle where maybe it's now translated. And this question of is this then translated in all tissue types or maybe just translated in the pancreas in this one example, um, that is actually unfortunately an unanswerable question at this point in time because it's we don't have the data sets actually to sufficiently um, answer that. I would say as a global statement um, that these, uh, in this case, these link RNA transcripts we know from prior data tend to be more lineage expressed, uh, but whether or not there's lineage translation, even if ubiquitous expression uh, is a question that we don't have the data to answer right now. Um, so where do these locate? Um, these locate uh, not just in link RNAs that, as we were talking about, but actually commonly uh, occur in uh, overlapping or other stretches of known mRNAs. So if an mRNA has a five prime untranslated region, a three prime untranslated region, and a coding sequence that encodes the protein in the middle, uh, you can actually now have multiple different um, amino acid peptide residues translated either before that or after that or overlapping that or entirely actually consumed within those same nucleic acids, but in a different uh, reading frame. And so an entirely different set of amino acids are encoded. So these little red arrows are not isoforms or extensions of this protein. Uh, they are entirely separate uh, entities. Um, so for some people, this may sort of raise a question of two proteins from one mRNA, which seems a little strange because uh, at least I was taught long ago that there is one protein per RNA uh, and that maybe in uh, model organisms, viruses, for example, uh, or lower organism, organisms, there are polycystronic RNAs. Viruses are known, of course, to have polycystronic RNAs. Really, that was never really promoted as mammalian biology. So uh, this idea that an RNA has the coding sequence, uh, how do, where does that come from? That comes from Beetle and Tatum, uh, which you guys may remember from your high school biology or maybe college biology. Uh, and they were working actually just on the eve of uh, World War II's announcement here in the US. Of course, it was already uh, raging in other parts of the world. Um, but they published this nice paper in October of 1941, uh, looking at Neospora, which is bread mold. And what they did was a series of very nice classical genetics assays. This, of course, is before the discovery of DNA, even uh, in the 1953-ish period. Uh, and they used radiation essentially to induce uh, what they knew to be mutations or disruptions, um, though they couldn't characterize them. Uh, and they looked for phenotypes after you radiated bread mold. And the phenotype that they uh, selected was growth inhibition without pyridoxine. Uh, pyridoxine is um, a cofactor that the neosporin um, are required to have. And so they were looking in these cases where they produced a mutant clone. Uh, they then actually did genetic and chemical rescue basically by adding back pyridoxine to the media um, and then crossing their neospora with other generations, creating F1 and F2 crosses and showing that you could remove uh, this phenotype genetically. Uh, and from that, they came up with this one gene, one protein hypothesis. The idea being that under normal circumstances, neospora uh, produce their own pyridoxine int intrinsically. And then when they mutated it, they required it to be supplemented. The issue is with uh, what they did is, you know, this actually was nothing to do with DNA level thing. It merely said that maybe one functional unit had one function, but didn't say how those different functional units were arranged. Uh, and uh, shortly thereafter, a young researcher, Marilyn Kozak, who actually failed to get any faculty positions on the East Coast uh, and went to Pittsburgh, um, uh, was looking at the structure of RNAs and began to find all of these upstream open reading frames or UORFs 
where there were ATG codons prior to actually the first one that the coding sequence used. Uh, and so asking the question of why does an RNA not encode a protein from the first ATG? Why do all these RNAs, not all of them, but why do many RNAs have uh, uh, preceding ATGs that do not contribute uh, ultimately to the, the annotated protein? Uh, and that's something that's motivated a lot of work uh, 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 now in the future. Uh, and so how do we find these? I'm, I'm going to put that aside and I'll come back to it. So going back to RiboSeq as a method. So if RiboSeq is now a good way to find these things, um, what you can see here is sort of a slightly lined up um, schematic of how RiboSeq and mass spectrometry compare. Uh, and you can kind of look at that on your own. But what I want to bring up is given that RiboSeq is an RNA sequencing based method, ultimately you align reads to um, the annotated transcriptome. Uh, and how do you then find reading frames here? Because it's not like RNA-seq where there is a more uniform distribution of reads. RiboSeq, the key to it is that the ribosome, when it moves from one codon, ATG, to the next, CCG here, it moves in a disconjugate uh, conjugate, um, kachunking, is my scientific way of describing it, meaning it moves from A sites to P sites and moves in a uh, fragmented way along the along the RNA as it is physically being moved three nucleotides at a time to the next codon and, and loading the next R, uh, tRNA. And so when you actually do the sequencing, there is a asymmetric abundance of reads that have a five prime end on that first uh, nucleotide um, in the codon. And so what you get out is then a periodicity calculation that looks like this, where there is an overabundance of reads that are located on the first nucleotide in the triple codon and relatively few reads that um, originate or initiate um, uh, on the second or third nucleotides. Um, and so good data versus bad data. Good data would look like this, where you can see this clear asymmetry um, between the first nucleotide and the codons um, and the second and third. Uh, realistically, it's hard to get much above maybe 82 or 83 percent of your reads being biased. The theoretical maximum, you know, would be like 100 percent. But in real life, um, it's hard to get it really above 85 percent. Um, and in, and uh, so bad data, a lot of people have bad RiboSeq data floating around out there. Uh, it looks like this, where you can see that is very much uh, diminished. And it's kind of hard to get that out. Um, so this is, I think, a, a key thing for any of you who are sort of interested in, in pursuing these types of experiments. All right, so there's real life implications to this. Um, you know, I'm uh, born of the non-coding RNA movement about a decade ago, maybe 12 years ago, uh, and I think it's great. Uh, I also recognize that there have been a lot of papers like this from very prominent groups like Paul and Howard Chang out at Stanford, um, and John Rin here, of course, a former Brody, where they have these big nature papers and they say, well, we have somatic tissue differentiation by the long non-coding RNA tinker. Uh, and now there are many subsequent papers where people talk about the long non-coding RNA tinker. The issue is, is that this was never a non-coding RNA. Um, and uh, this has this very nice peptide sequence that even has actually a weak but present ubiquitin uh, recognition site there. Um, it's found by RiboSeq. It actually even was uh, conserved, um, but maybe not sufficiently so at the time of the Human Genome Project for them to call it. The side note on that is, of course, conservation, the power to detect conservation is dependent on the number of species you have to cross a line. And so as history has gone forward, our abilities to detect conserved ORFs has improved since the initial Human Genome Project. Um, so anyway, so, so this is a, a protein coding gene. Um, and uh, I guess that's that. Um, so it is something to sort of think about a little bit when you're rifling through older literature where maybe this uh, notion was uh, less prominent. So how do we interpret this um, stuff? There's a lot of debate out there on what does one make of these riboseq ORFs. And on one spectrum, we say, well, this is really a normal protein that was just missed. Um, and those are out there. Uh, they're getting fewer in number because we've found a lot of them already using RiboSeq and now start to, to annotate them. But on the uh, on the other side of things, you just say, well, this is a junk peptide or a junk something or other. And it's stochastic randomness of uh, ribosome interactions. So the model there is RNA polymerase as a transcription machinery is known to 
you know, plunk down at promoters and create all sorts of little transcripts that are uh, unstable. Um, and not all of them are really uh, RNA transcripts of, you know, like forward moving function, if you will. Some of them are sort of these noise burst of stuff that happens where it pulls out. And then of course there's anything in the middle. So how do we start to think about this? Uh, and how many of them are real or stable proteins? This is actually something that's been a hot topic in the literature. And this is work uh, from Aviv when she was here and Tamara when she was here and Steve Carr, uh, who's still here. Um, and uh, they've done one nice study on this and, and there've been similar studies uh, where essentially what they were able to show is that a large fraction of these ORFs, uh, when you detect them by mass spectrometry, actually you just detect them on the MHC class one immunopeptidome, um, but they are much less commonly detected intracellularly in a whole proteome uh, analysis. Uh, and this has the implication of maybe they are unstable or rapidly degraded um, fragments. I can't give a final word on this. There are many opinions on these type of data, um, and I don't think we really have a a holistic view of what this might mean biologically, but it does raise the question of really how many of these are directed translation versus translational misproducts that then get degraded and put out onto the um, onto the immunopeptidome or, or exported from the cell. Um, questions about that, or are we still okay? Um, what do you think? So, I mean, where do you go from there then? If there's a if there's a set of peptides that may um, the degradation products uh, that you're particularly interested in for your condition? Do you have a recommendation of what people would do to follow that up? Yeah, it's a good question. So I think it's, um, it, I think it depends on what your scientific goal is. Uh, if your goal is to find stable new proteins that contribute to physiology here or wherever, um, I think it does start to be a little concerning if you can only find that protein on the immunopeptidome and not on the whole proteome. The caveat there, I'm not a deep expert in proteomics, but the immunopeptidome picks up non-triptic fragments, um, whereas the whole proteome, they're triptic fragments. And many of these ORFs are small. They don't produce many triptic fragments, and so that can be a false negative. Conversely, um, it so happens that many ORFs in promoter regions, what we call upstream ORFs, are very GC rich because promoters are GC rich. And when you have GC rich uh, sequences, you produce generally a lot of arginines because arginine is encoded by C's and G's and arginines are cleaved by trypsin. So you have this paradigm of maybe you're too short to get good amino, uh, good tryptic fragments or you have so many arginines that you're just being diced up by trypsin. And so the, the tryptic fragments, they're just like, you know, they're not, they're not mappable because they're just a couple amino acids. So where do you go from this? I think, you know, many people are looking at this from a phenomenological standpoint, meaning trends over systems or immunological standpoint, are these, um, inter, you know, uh, having effects on cell, immune cell interactions. I think that if you actually have an individual candidate that you are specifically interested as a candidate, I think it does mean that the burden of proof is more on you in doing things like in, um, epitope tags or inserting endogenous tags in the genome to actually uh, demonstrate real translation or maybe raising a custom antibody. Uh, and I think unfortunately it just means more work is needed um, if you really want to prove it. Um, okay, so what have, what have we done? And then we'll move forward to the study. So uh, many of these are, we think, functional um, or phenotype. This is work that Todd and I have done over the past year where we've come up with large libraries of these and done functional genomics, uh, finding that about half of them may in fact make stable translation products when you do tag them, uh, as opposed to just looking in the endogenous proteome, um, that maybe about 30% of them have some sort of activity in cells measured by uh, RNA transcription profiling after introducing them into cells. And we've been looking in cancer for vulnerability phenotypes and find about 10% of them have that. Uh, and you can get these really quite striking um, profiles, such as this over here. This is a gene, C6 or 62, where there's a five prime UTR and then the coding sequence. And we find this UORF uh, in, the, in the five prime UTR that when we knock it out with CRISPR, each dot here is a CRISPR guide RNA, uh, you can see a profound loss of cell viability that's really specific to that one little section. And these are diff three different cell lines. Uh, and so uh, I do think that some of these are definitely functional entities uh, in their own right. So the, the next twofold problem that we're going to spend the last few minutes talking on before I, I let you go um, is the twofold problem of what 
uh, species actually exist? Um, is there an actual data set somewhere there? And how do we standardize research on them? Because uh, right now it's a little bit every lab doing things their own way. Uh, and so we'll talk about you know, these various methods and these various things, and we're gonna focus a little bit more time on the database question coming up. So the preprint uh, that was alluded to before is shown here, it's on BioArchive, and, and hopefully it will be formally published soon, as soon as the SPAC and revision and the editors got it. Um, but we've put this group together and we've been looking at them, uh, I think as a team. Uh, and so this question of what ORS actually exists. So this is a highly debated number, but there are a bunch. And I purposely made that non-scientific and just saying there's a bunch um, because it depends on which methods you're using and uh, what you believe. And so ribosome profiling has some pros, it's unbiased, it's genome wide, but it has some cons. It doesn't actually show protein production. Um, mass spectrometry, you know, the pros are that actually shows protein production. The cons is it's biased against many of these sequences as we already talked about. Uh, and so this has led in my mind to about four camps of people. Camp number one is that there are probably thousands of ores. So that's kind of a minimum. Um, nobody thinks there are like 10 or 20 or 100. Camp two says, oh, there are actually hundreds of thousands, maybe the 300,000 in source. Camp three says, well, I think there's hundreds of thousands of ores, but a lot of them are noise. And maybe there's just a couple thousand that we really believe. And camp four says, this is all rubbish. Um, and I say that again, not glibly, but this is actually the, the debate that, that I think is actually going on in the community. Um, and so, a lot of this then is because there's a lot of variability in, in how these assays are done and how these experiments are done. Uh, and so what this is meant to show is that uh, when you're doing a riboseq experiment, you can either have higher periodicity, high quality data, lower periodicity, low quality data, and that can either nominate um, when you're searching the human genome, more ORFs or fewer ORFs, depending on kind of which method of computational approach you're using listed here, or whether or not you drug treat um, your cells. I'll talk about that in one second. Um, and so what I would say in general is uh, low periodicity um, studies are hindered either by data quality, and so they don't find much, or they don't know how to analyze their data and they put a whole lot of stuff out there and you want to avoid that. That's not a good place to be. Um, the Once you get into higher quality data, it really spans the, met, the um, spectrum, and that's highly debated based upon all of these computational and, and uh, cell conditions uh, shown over here. So what are drug treatments? Uh, this is when you pre-treat your uh, cultured cells. Um, you, you can't really do this as well with tissue samples, for example, um, but this is where you treat pre-treat culture cells with a drug. Um, and there are a couple of things. There's cyclohexamide, which blocks translation and kind of um, elongation, I should say. So the ribosomes freeze on the RNA transcript uh, at the coding sites. And there's homoherringtonin and lactinomycin, which block the initial elongation steps. So they all, all the ribosomes pile up right at the start. So what does that look like? Here's just a screenshot where you see a gene uh, and you have RNA-seq where you see green as the expression of the RNA exons. And you can see how it's expressed out into the UTR. Red is riboseq, and you see nicely that it's falling on coding exons here, but not in this uh, UTR over there, or not over there. Uh, and then blue is homoherringtonin, and you see just one spike. Uh, and that just one spike um, tells you exactly where the protein starts, right, where the ribosome starts to translate. Uh, and that's very useful when you're trying to find or nominate um, non-canonical open reading frames, because it can be tough to know where they start or how to necessarily define them. Um, many people now have moved away from moving cyclohexamide just because it induces some biases, uh, is not critical, but some people still use it. So what we've done uh, with this uh, preprint um, is to assemble an international group of experts on this. And the reason uh, to do this is that uh, many labs do this their own way, um, and many labs publish lists of data, uh, lists of um, ORFs, that are uncurated and it's hard, I think, to know what to believe or what not to believe. So we figured, uh, why not just get people together and start to hash through this the hard way by coming up with some international standards. Uh, and you can see here, it, it encompasses a lot of different organizations at this point, um, and it's kind of headed uh, through the Gen Code uh, ensemble apparatus that's in the UK. Um, we're heavily involved with the Human Proteome Project, um, uh, out at, uh, headed, I guess I should say, at the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle. Uh, and then there are a couple of major academic um, collaborators of which were one. Uh, and we've been trying to figure out a couple of main questions, which is 
how do you actually gain trust in someone else's analysis, right? If we're going to start to think about these things as real, is there a way that we can have a um, uh, more systematic approach to them and understanding them? Uh, and we're really interested then at this time of what type and what role mass spectrometry plays um, in trying to annotate these or share them to the rest of the community. As I mentioned, a relatively few number of these have traditional mass spectrometry evidence, but that could certainly be false negative in some cases. And so whether or not mass spectrometry is now going to be uh, required to call something an annotated human protein uh, is one of the topics that we're debating. Uh, and I don't have a final answer on that for you right now. So um, what is this issue with mass spectrometry? Just to lay it out explicitly, um, there are potentially technological issues on maybe not finding riboseq ORFs. Uh, you can find fewer transcendized fragments, as I uh, said before, they might perform poorly. There's wide variability in how approaches go. And um, standard LCMSMS may not have a high enough sensitivity. And actually we're finding more when we do things like SRM or selective reaction monitoring, which is a, a more sensitive and more targeted version of mass spec. Uh, and even as protein sequencing now starts to become a topic, it's certainly not mainstream, but there are labs developing direct protein sequencers. I think that will be very interesting here too. Um, the other aspect that we've already talked about is the biological, which maybe the mass majority of these don't make actual proteins or they're just unstable peptides. Uh, and so this continues to be something that um, I think will be a big topic over the next several years. So the last thing I'll mention though on this is we should not assume that the lack of a protein, assume it doesn't make a protein. We should not assume that the lack of a protein means that ribose or if is wrong or useless. And the reason why I say that is many of these are likely to be regulatory in, in nature. They may likely regulate translation of other RNAs or of the mRNAs they're located on. Uh, and so they could still be critical functional elements in the genome, but maybe more conceptually akin to an enhancer, if you will, rather than more conceptually similar to like a protein coding gene. Uh, and so I would not discard them uh, if you're not finding evidence of an actual protein and you're doing multiple assays. So once we find all these ORFs, what do we do? Um, we could either be like you're a Scrooge McDuck, for those of you old enough to remember DuckTales, um, who has a big vault of money and just swims around in it, or the Monopoly guy over here, who I guess is a maybe a controversial um, social figure right now, but whatever, uh, throwing the money away and sort of distributing it to, to, the, to the masses. Uh, and we've taken the approach that we should try to distribute these rather than have them located in-house within labs. Uh, and so we've been advocating for data sharing and data centralization uh, and doing that through databases, um, which are the way in which we can sort of scientifically communicate to each other these things. The databases has led us to the uh, uh, topic of gen code as arbiters, as global resources and, and Uniprot as well. Um, and of course, just to state the blazingly obvious, uh, we're all kind of dependent on these people, uh, on the folks who run these annotation databases, because at Nomad or TCGA, Cancer Genome Analysts, or just in your own research, uh, we're all always downloading the files and mapping reads or um, using them for our analyses. Uh, so really, uh, we enter now into the cycle of trying to provide them feedback and improvements to come up with next generation. Uh, and the idea here is to um, try to understand or try to make this a more transparent uh, group of ORFs for people. So this one I mentioned at the beginning, it's well described. And in fact, four groups have published on it with four different names. And this type of thing, this type of thing sort of leads to a lot of confusion in the group. And I think gen code and groups like that are the ones who are going to be able to uh, distill uh, very specific nomenclatures that then will facilitate uh, global research and we don't get confused and bogged down in this type of stuff. So the model here is that we are consolidating and categorizing them, we are collaborating and we're trying to make something that's end user accessible, meaning very soon uh, gen code will be uh, supporting actual files that you and everyone here at the Broad will be able to download from their website in the same way you can download their file of link RNAs or protein coding genes or all transcripts, you will be able to download files of gen code supported ORFs. So how did we come about and do this? Um, this is not perfect and will certainly be revised over the years, but we thought we'd take an initial stab at it. Um, we started by um, using publicly available data. Gen code is not an academic lab that produces its own data. 
And we had a couple of thresholds that we developed internally to have really high stringency data sets, limiting it ultimately to only seven data sets, which is a very small number. And that's one criticism of this work that really there are more data sets that probably have useful data, but we wanted to start with a high confidence data sets to start with. Um, and then we have done some uh, filtering, including removing pseudogenes, which may be translated, but at this time were uh, a little less well vetted. And we are now going to be putting out a list of about 7,000 of these ORFs. Now, among these seven data sets, the majority of those 7,000 were actually found within just one of those seven. Uh, a minority were found in uh, more than one of the seven. I do not think that that means they're less trustworthy. I think this means that there are cell type differences. So many of these uh, data sets are single cell type, hex cells or HeLa cells, or one of them is actually cardiac cells. And so you will find you know, cell type specific things in each of those events. Now, there are some blazingly obvious uh, issues with this analysis. We've removed things less than 16 amino acids, uh, things that weren't mapping, and importantly, we removed things that are not uh, starting with an AUG or ATG start codon. This was all because data curation from public data sets uh, is a, a spotty business. And when the initial data sets are incomplete in certain areas, uh, we tended to be conservative rather than including only partial data from certain data sets. So what this means, though, is that of these 7,000 that uh, we're trying to support, uh, a large number are being excluded, things that are really small and things that uh, have near cognate or non-ATG start sites. And these are a very large category, as you can see here. I think the issue is, is that they're much harder to define. Um, and I, I expect these numbers that you see here, 11,000, 13,000, to be overestimates and we're going to have to have some sort of metrics to kind of get those into uh, a more um, solid sounding uh, reason. Now, why is that? It's hard to predict these with RiboSeq. Um, there are some, each computer algorithm does it differently. Uh, and so they're just harder to standardize. So one of the things that we are uh, doing is trying to come up with our international experts to actually reanalyze the data in a way that uh, will get the, to this question of near cognate ORFs uh, in a much better um, in a much better way. So, just um, maybe I should have shown this before, but uh, just to um, define that specifically, near cognate ORFs are ORFs that do not begin with an ATG, but rather typically a CTG of a T GTG or a TTG. And of these, actually CTGs are really quite common. In fact, uh, CMIC as a gene has now been re-annotated by Genco to start with a CTG uh, rather than an ATG. So if you are a database nerd, you can go and check gen code from 10 years ago and gen code from today. Um, and that's actually true. So CMIC is a little bigger than we thought it was. Um, there are other groups out there that advocate for other initiation codons. Uh, this is highly debated um, and we have not really gone into that. It's, I think the data is not mature yet. So a couple examples of things that are coming this way. Um, and I don't know exactly how we're doing on time, but hopefully we have maybe two minutes left here. Um, You're fine. Okay. So, so here's an example of uh, a protein that will be annotated now um, coming up. Uh, this is a protein couched within the HNRNPUL2 gene. Uh, and so what you see here um, is in bold is the start ATG of HNRNPUL2, it's a mouthful, but that's the annotated protein starting here at ATG. Uh, and it goes ATG, GAG, et cetera. The overlapping ORF that will be annotated starts with this GTG. And so it starts V-L-A-R-E-A-E. -E. Uh, and you can see that it's an entirely different reading frame. It does not include a methionine at this locus. It has um, other amino acids there. Uh, and using our uh, collaborations with proteomics folks, we can find peptides for these in many data sets. And you can see this is only a partial list, it gets cut off, but you know, it's all over the place. It's in tonsil, smooth muscle, fallopian tube, et cetera, um, T cells. Uh, and so we find many good peptides to this uh, out of frame upstream overlapping ORF. So these things exist. Another example that I think is interesting uh, is an internal ORF here. Um, this is in a G, the GSG1 gene. This is a, a testis enriched gene um, where uh, it's lineage expressed in, in the testes. Uh, and what you can see here, uh, this is maybe not quite as prettily done on my behalf, but the um, annotated GSG1 gene starts with this ATG. So, eight, and you can see each codon here, I've highlighted alternately blue and yellow. 
the uh, internal out of frame orf starts in the middle. So actually after this ATG and it starts with this ATG right there. Um, and it goes and encodes these amino acids. Uh, and it's quite big actually, um, or quite long, I should say. Uh, and we can find multiple different peptides. These are the peptide identifiers. So we find up to three peptides in various uh, uh, data sets, mainly of testis. Um, so, so I guess, so what? What's the sort of big, why should you care? One way of saying this, and, and um, you know, Todd Gall, my, my mentor, and I guess Institute Director, uh, always pushes me on this and always pushes me on the, so what question? You know, So what if there are 20,000 annotated proteins and now you just said, okay, we added a thousand, so there are twenty-one thousand, um, and you just sort of increase it a little bit. So I, I think the so what here is that I think we're laying the groundwork for a way to re uh, fundamentally revise the way we think about the human genome, particularly translation of ORFs uh, and translation of mRNAs. We're now uh, a common model in my mind is that a single mRNA can produce one or two proteins, uh, whereas I think cognitively we were all taught that. RNA and proteins, you know, an RNA would make one protein. Uh, so the idea that they make two uh, opens up a big uh, can of worms, including discrepancies between mass spectrometry and RNA seq data. So there's long history of data of a long history of uh, proteomic data and RNA seq data not correlating excellently. Um, they correlate somewhat, but maybe part of that is because actually um, you're looking at the wrong protein to correlate to the RNA. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of different fields of research that are going to be um, impacted with this in time, including um, population genetics and disease variants and um, how we interpret quote unquote non-coding variants if they actually are in one of these ORFs, uh, as well as um, just basic science and how do proteins evolve? Many of these are not well conserved. And so are they protogenes or emerging or sequences? Um, and so I think that there's actually uh, a lot of interesting stuff that will come from this. Um, so as my last slide, uh, this is uh, actually, a, I think, a, a graphic illustration of one way to think about this. This is uh, the, the, um, the French Revolution and actually a painting housed in the National Gallery in London, which is kind of ironic given that the British beat, beat back Napoleon a couple of times. Um, and uh, with the question of how many proteins are unknown, think about it this way. So what if you take the opening paragraph to a very famous book uh, by a Londoner about the French, French Revolution? And what if you were to remove 10% of the words and just think about how much meaning you've lost from this from this paragraph or how much meaning you may have lost from the human genome. And those words are, of course, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. What if, though, you then deleted 10% of the ands, ifs, or buts, and you were to reread this? You would actually still get the meaning of the paragraph. It would just sound like choppy syntax. So I think this is going to be one of the key conceptual questions going forward. We find these things. Were we missing stuff that was really central to disease processes all along, or were we actually capturing the disease important things to begin with, and these are going to end up being peripheral? It's a question I don't really have a big answer to, but I think that's going to be a, something for us to work out. Um, so let us know if you're interested. We're developing projects in a consortium level, uh, and if uh, sort of interests align, we'd be uh, more than delighted to chat with you. Um, and you can email me uh, directly there. Um, and then just my thanks for Todd and the many people who have supported this. And I want to particularly highlight uh, the international collaborators that we've um, worked quite closely on this. Um, and I guess that's that's what I've got for you today. Uh, I, I will take, though, I'm going to go off script and give just one minute. I want to show everybody my mug. It's just the Societally Engaged Scientist course. This is a course that we've been developing at the Broad. And in 2022, we'll do our second, uh, inaug second annual um, course where we are trying to get scientists to learn how to advocate for science in the community and in the government and trying to teach scientists how to engage in, in the broader world so that we can help uh, advance the mission of science amongst all of us. So once again, I'm going to promote that and you get a nice mug if you participate too. Good. Thank you so much, John, for such a just really informative talk and a, a great survey of kind of how to enter the field also. Um, there's one question from uh, Justin Bosch, uh, which said, great talk. Is the SMORF consortium working with annotation centers other than GenCode? For example, would there be updates on translated SMORFs uh, in other model organisms like fish, worms, flies, and yeast? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, 
that is a future goal. It is not a present reality. And so within our consortium, there is a very strong uh, contingent of people who are pushing for this, uh, including Ariel Bazzini, Bazzini uh, who is out at um, the Stowers Institute uh, in Missouri. Um, and, and they're very much, we're very much aware that there's riboseq data across multiple organisms. Right now, we're only focusing on human um, and getting sort of uh, RefSeq and Uniprot and GenCode, all of those big databases on board. Uh, but moving to the other sort of other ones, I think is definitely important. And if that's something that's interesting to you, um, you know, please reach out. And, and I think that the team would be happy to talk to you more about that. Great, thank you. Um, and then I was just, I guess, wondering within this, what, what do you feel like is, uh, since your field is oncology, what do you think is the most direct relevance of this work um, to kind of uh, either clinical diagnosis or future therapeutics um, within oncology? Yeah, so I think a great question. So I think um, the therapeutics question uh, I'll take first. Um, so I think it's unlikely that there's a medicine that directly targets any of these uh, present right now. You'd have to, I think, intentionally go off and design one such thing. However, many of the ones that are being presented on the HLA immunopeptidome, whether they're stable or unstable or whatever they are, uh, those are actually being actively investigated as uh, uh, putative targets for, for personal vaccine development um, via immunotherapy. Uh, since they uh, do engage T cells quite actively, um, and have a nice signature there. So I think that's the most direct clinical um, direction for the therapeutics. Uh, I think in the future, one could envision finding, you know, a new ORF that you could then design a drug to um, because it has an important role in cancer biology. But as we all know, drug development and drug design takes a long time. And so I don't think that's going to be quick, but I think it probably will come. Um, the other sort of aspect of this is uh, I think the understanding of the human genome and disease. And this is cancer and this is also non-cancer, uh, but I can speak to the cancer aspect. Um, you know, particularly in pediatrics, which is my home discipline, um, there are many uh, tumors that we call quiet or many tumors where we do not find um, driving initiated genetic events. And then it's an open question as to whether or not those tumors do have actually driving genetic events that are simply located in the non-canonical ORF space. And in fact, there have already been some um, sort of casual, I guess I'd say, or, or anecdotal publications along the way of such things happening, particularly um, not in annotated, if you will, um, non-canonical ORS because they haven't been annotated before, but there have been observations that actually a variant in cancer and even other diseases at this point will create a, a new ATG um, and then translate a new cancer-specific ORF. Uh, and then that cancer-specific ORF has actually been shown to have functions, um, typically interfering with things, as, as one might imagine, rather than positively advancing things, more of an interference thing. But interference or not, that's still a new way to envision the genetic basis of disease that uh, could lead to diagnosis and subtyping of patients. That's so interesting. Makes me want to go back and look at all the non-coding variants that we dismissed as being in uninteresting regions. <laughs> great. Well, thank you again for your talk today. Um, and uh, I hope everyone has a great day. Yeah. Thank you all. Happy to be here with you.